Do you think it was Elmer's glue? That's what it looked like to me. <laughs> and they had him just stuff his face with it? Yeah. We didn't actually, you never see it go in his mouth. You, and that's true. And then they cut away and it's not on him I at actu- all. I actually know what they used for that tree sap that's all white and looks definitely like you semen. Got, you got to tell you got to say this. I will tell you that. <laughs> oh. Hey, everybody in podcast land and also on YouTube. Welcome to the episode where we said, too bad. I s- what? Too bad to the poll. Democracy oh, is dead. That's right. We did a poll and we we scorned it. This is how democracy dies with the thunder applause be- from yeah. us. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'd like to apologize. We just really wanted to do the the fountain. You two wanted to do the fountain. I wanted to do it. Oh. And you guys are. And lucky David enough. also wanted to do it because he loves it. <laughs> He's even so wearing much. a shirt with a tree on it right yeah. now. Yeah, that was just a. Uh, He's wearing a. Quinketing. Your shirt is like a DNA strand that kind of goes out into a tree, tree branches. Very tree of life. Dang, looks dude. better than anything that's in that movie. And, uh, <laughs> oh wow! I'm tripping. Look at it right now. <laughs> we have some Woo. things to say before we get into your rating, though. Out of ten, David. That's right. Out of ten. <gasps> first thing to say, we list in. We're bringing back the numbers. Woo! The ratings are back. Out of ten, ratings supplies. are back. Up to up to. Infinite decimal places if you want, David. Oh, I got one. I'll and, do one. Okay, he's allowed to do that, and I'm allowed to attack him. Yes, that's what it's <laughs> but all I'll, about. But I'll pull my punches. <laughs> and the second thing to talk about is, I think, if you guys enjoy this episode, if you're stoked that we picked the fountain, if you're not stoked but you listened to it and it was a good episode overall, you should share this podcast because, you know what? It might be cool to do some movies that uh, weren't so huge, that weren't blockbusters sometimes. I agree. That might be considered uh, Aronofsky's biggest failure in his <laughs> rising career. This movie's sweet, and I'm glad we, we're getting to talk about it now. Well, um, according to you. It is sweet. This movie fucking rules. Not according to critics everywhere. Okay, let's start with this critic. David, what's your rating for this movie and your capsule review? What do you call a short movie that still lasts an eternity? What do you call a drug trip that doesn't take you anywhere truly more awe-inspiring than your local 7-Eleven? What? What do you call style over substance when it doesn't even look that good? Dude. Well, I guess you call it the fountain. You're the worst. What the heck was that? Suck it. Are you joking right now? What are Not you talking about? Even style over a substance? A little bit. The it's, whole thing is... There's so much substance. This is substance abuse. Like <laughs> Requiem for a Dream. <laughs> okay, give me your ratings. I want to get into it. I'm ready. Oh. Okay, so... I gave you a little bit. I gave a little bit of a shout out to people. Wait, wait, wait. What's like, your number out of ten? Oh yeah. So this is why numbers are stupid. Because I gave it a five point three, <laughs> and that would land it somewhere between Ang Lee's The Hulk and Attack of the Clones. What? Wait, what? It's clearly a better movie than that. But wait, I wait, enjoy wait, wait, it wait. That, that land uh, on your what spreadsheet you of twelve hundred movies. That's where it lands. That's exactly where it lands. <laughs> Like the rows above and below it. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think there's like a couple more, but basically between that's, those two. And that's why. That's why. I mean, hey, I don't want to bash your big giant list going into infinity, but like, come on. Oh, I know. I know. You gave it a five point three. That's why we quit ra- quit ratings because like there are silly. I thought you wanted to keep the ratings. No, no, no. I think they're silly because I recognize that this it doesn't make sense. I enjoyed it then as much as a five point three. Give it a better but I, rating. But then. I recognize that there is better elements. Preposterous. Okay. So my, okay, my adjusted score would be a six. Okay, so we're gonna start. We're gonna <laughs> the first podcast where we bring the ratings back. We're just arguing about the ratings again. <laughs> so they wanted okay, this. But, you asked for this. So you're saying you're saying that. Wait, just real quick. Oh, so your final score is a six. Yeah, final score is a six. Oh. How about you, Riley? That's so hilarious. I also give it a six. No. <laughs> See what? Yeah! <laughs> See what? what? This is what I'm so confused about. You say you don't like it. But I like this movie a lot, and I gave it a six. But wait a second, but a five is just like a meh. Okay, here's my slogan. Here's here's my slogan. All right, let, let me hear it. Death is the road to awe, and it's also the road to not having to watch any more Darren Aronofsky movies. <laughs> <laughs> but don't go to Shababa before you watch this one, because I haven't really seen many of his movies, but I like this one. Listen, six out of ten. That's because I really enjoy it. I subjectively really enjoy this movie. But I recognize... It doesn't sound like you really enjoyed it. It sounds like you just barely enjoyed it. Well, okay. There's a bit of a story here, which we'll get into later. But, like, I watched this in 2007 or 8 or whenever. I think... When did it come out? 2006? Yeah. So I think I watched it, like, shortly after 2006. And I loved it as like, you know, whenever, how how old was I? 18? Yeah. Something like that? Younger. And I... And I... (laughs) And I love this movie. The score, the visuals, uh, uh, the 
You're the worst, David. I'm sorry, I can't help myself. Perfect, and I love that. The I, I loved the score. I loved the visuals. I loved how it like forces you to confront mortality and stuff like that. And that you know, at, at an 18 year old, you're thinking about all this stuff. And I loved it. Watching it for the second time, I'm like, I can recognize why people don't like the movie, and so that's why it kind of brings it. It would have been like a 7.5, and now seeing it for the second time, I think I'm kind of like brought it brought it down to a six. Because I, I recognize that there's a lot of things missing. Mm. But that's where I am. I can't wait to have those elucidated because I actually, <laughs> having watched this the third time, I don't know why people don't like it. Really? I think it's so sweet. Here's my uh, capsule review, my slogan. As far as Hollywood movies go, The Fountain is a black swan anomaly that no <laughs> other movie can wrestle from its status <laughs> as mother of dreamy oh. pie-in-the-sky sci-fi dramas. Oh, jeez. See what I did there? I... Yep, we 8. all... 8.5. 8.5. 8.5. So that's an average score of negative 44. You know, I don't know. Maybe in our discussion I might bring it back up. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Always I malleable, think, I think I, I really... Yeah, I really... Well, I like to be malleable. I don't want to be uh, stuck in my ways. Can you synopsize this movie for us? I sure can. In modern day America, scientist Tom Creo desperately searches for the cure to his wife's illness. In 16th century Spain, a conquistador named Tomas is sent by the queen to find the tree of life, the sap of which grants immortality. Mm, in the juicy fa- jizz sap. Ooh. <laughs> uh. In the far future, bald Hugh Jackman, who we're going to call Space Tom, journeys to the dying star Shabalba in a bubble ship with the tree of life that is also his wife in an attempt to keep it alive so he can keep eating its weird hairy bark? These three stories intertwine as each Tom Carnation faces off against death itself in the ultimate multi-dimensional cage match you've ever seen. (laughs) (laughs) Of all the ultimate ones, (laughs) the ones you've never seen. (laughs) Yes, if you were confused by that synopsis, that's the movie. It's kind of confusing, but... On the second watch, it made a lot more sense. Yeah, one of the biggest complaints about this movie is how like kind of vague it is. But yeah, I think I pretty much got it. I do have some questions that I'm not sure anyone knows what's going on. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, not even Darren. <laughs> not even our good friend Darren. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna call Darren. We'll get him on the phone right after this message from our sponsor, <laughs> Private Internet Access VPN. <laughs> PIA helps you hide your true IP address so you can bypass geo restrictions and censorship. You can connect up to five devices at once and it includes an internet kill switch. If your VPN gets disconnected involuntarily. PIA is available for Windows, Mac, Android, iOS, and even as a Chrome extension. So check it out at lmg.gg slash carpool PIA. It wasn't an explosion this time. It was just like an actual. Yeah. Mm, I could have done it better. No, I, I loved you. No, I'm sorry, James. I still do. Who does Darren Aronofsky think he is? He thinks he went to Harvard and fi- <laughs> and he did. He went to Harvard and studied film, and then he later went to like yeah. a, Academy of what is it called? Academy of Film, where he uh, did. Um, does he d- does uh, he, directing? Does he come from money? Sure does. Because he comes from Harvard. He really all of his movies just come across with like an air of just you know pomp. Just like I am so freaking deep, dude. Some of his movies are better than others, though. I think None like, of them rec- are better than Rec- this Requiem one. Requiem for a Dream. It- <laughs> Stop it, <laughs> dude. That's my opinion, honestly. I'm looking at his movies here. They're all in my snops, in my like, uh, in my slogan, right? You've got his first one was Pie, yep. which I watched the first half until my baby woke up this weekend, and it's good. It's it's okay. I mean, it won him uh, at Sundance like best original or best first screenplay. Yep. It's good. It's better than my first screenplay, <laughs> but it's still very first movie. For sure. Uh, and then he's got Requiem for a Dream. That's huge. Like that was a huge cult hit. There's no other movie I think I've seen that I've had as strong a reaction as Requiem for a Dream. So that's a pretty standout film to me. Then he's got The Wrestler, which everybody likes, but yeah, it's, it's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good, right? Yep. That's fine. The Wrestler was. Well, I I remember enjoying that movie, but it's definitely like a bit out there compared to his other movies. It doesn't deal. It's with like, like less like, out there. Yeah. What? Yeah, what did it's I say? out there. It's out there as far Sorry, as his yeah. movies for not being out there. Yeah. It's, Black Swan is great though. I love Black Swan. Mm-hmm. That's an excellent movie. It I uses just, a surreal element so, so well. Wait, 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 wait. So you like all these other movies from mm-hmm. Darren Aronofsky, but you don't like this one. Yeah. I can recognize that this think, movie has a very interesting intellectual core, and it still kind of balances it out with good emotionality, but where it fails is actually on a very technical level. On pretty much any technical level, we're going to go through it, and I'm going to break down why this movie is actually really bad. You're the worst. I'm ready. 
I'm ready for this. Okay, well, I feel like we need to start with that because I just I like I'm, I don't want to start talking about this movie and like how much it's cool and have David sitting there the whole time being like, "You guys are so dumb." But why don't we talk about something I like? And I think the story. No, stories, no, I yeah. want to hear what he likes. I think the story is actually uh. pretty good. The script is very well written. It's clear, uh, and I think it's like pretty does a really good job of tying in these like multi timeline elements. And I think it's pretty easy to follow where most movies that try this kind of multi timeline thing can be really confusing. Mm. I, I think I was uh, I was more confused by the timelines the first time I watched it, and now this time going through, I was kind of like, oh, okay, so, I mean, we can we can discuss this, but it seems like the Conquist- Conquistador storyline is basically just her book. It's it's uh, mm-hmm. uh, Isabel's, Isabel's Isabel's yeah. book. Oh, yeah. And so that what we're seeing is basically just a dramatization of that book. The real story is Tom in modern day as the scientist trying to save his his wife and the future space tom is is either a you know a literal future 500 years in the in the future or whatever where they find out how to travel through space and ship tree ship bubbles or it's like a metaphorical representation of the struggle that that tom is going through in in the modern see, day i i see it slightly differently i think actually the main story is him in the bubble, like the present, right. the present day, like the where the speaker is at when speaking, mm-hmm. if I can say that, which is Tom, like sure. he he's in space, yeah. like that's today, because the, all the doctor stuff when he's Tommy, yeah, that's all through memories, right, 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 that's all flashbacks. So essentially, but uh, yeah, and then within the flashbacks, there's the fictional story of the conquistador Tomas, right. I and I'm I think that uh, Darren Aronofsky, in his ultimate wisdom, you know. <laughs> Made this movie so that we people would have those discussions and like talk about which one is like the real story, or which one's real, or which one's a metaphor or whatever. So I think what you just said is right. Well, it gets fishy though because his wife gives him like this seed that he plants on at her grave, and that makes a tree, right? So then when you see him in space, presumably they have solved death. He has achieved immortality, uh-huh. and he's traveling in space with the tree that he planted of his wife. So that's all in the past. But the reason that it's weird is because throughout the Conquistador story that his wife wrote is unfinished. She died before she wrote that last chapter. That whole story stands as a, like a synecdoche for or a metaphor for the entire their relationship in their life, right? And he doesn't know how to end the story. She's saying, write the story, finish the story so that when I die, like right. y- you die too and it's all good but instead of you he, being like grieving. He's trying so hard to keep the story going. He doesn't want to end it. He doesn't know how to end it. He's still fighting. He yeah. can't let go. But then... He, when he finally does finish the story, he finishes it by uh, going back in his memories to the present day Tom guy and that crucial moment where his wife is alive and inviting him to go on a walk in the snow with him. And before he blew her off because he had to go to work to try to actually save her life, he rewrites his own history. It says, you know what? I'm going to actually go on that walk with her. He goes on that walk with her. That's when she gives him the seed uh-huh. that he plants in on her grave. Whoa, wait a that second. Creates the tree that it's in the spaceship. Huh. So there's See, a paradox here. Oh. You you're saying there's a time travel paradox? Yes. Cuz I didn't I never saw I never saw it that way. Okay, so so that is all a valid reading I think if the future reality is literally the future. But there are a couple things that make it kind of weird as uh, that that indicate it, it might be, just be a metaphor or just kind of like a abstraction of of Tommy Creo's subconscious, you know? Okay, so the seed that she gives him, that's not the tree of life. That's just this random seed. That's right. Right. So how does that work? Well, I don't actually believe that she is the tree of life on the spaceship. Other than the fact that uh, like maybe visual simulators, like there's like that hair that comes off the bark. Yeah. But that's about it. Well, okay, so there's that. I mean, it's big, I guess, but <laughs> <laughs> when he's surviving off of eating it, <clears throat> he's surviving off of eating it. So, yeah. it, so it is the tree of life. Yeah. Oh, I guess you're right. It is a tree of life, but how could it be a tree of life when it, he just planted a regular old seal, seed? Mm. I think there's there is no clear answers, and I think that's kind of the point. I right. think it's supposed to be a little ambiguous that you can interpret it in more of a the conquistador story is uh, the novel that is presented in the story, and then there's a metaphor, or that it's also kind of like a more real thing that there is three timelines that are attached and yeah. i think it works both ways and i think that's one of the strengths of the movies is that like you can spend a little time thinking about it and it still holds up yeah but even if it doesn't even if it's wishy-washy and the, you can't make sense of it and you think it's vague i still don't think that ruins the movie for me in any way no i agree. I think that it's like um kind of like criticism that some people like us 
may have gotten for things like Spirited Away, where it's like you're just reading too hard. You're too stuck in your Western lens that you can't really like appreciate what's good about this movie. And you're getting caught up on things that don't really matter, that aren't the focus. Yeah. I definitely apply that to this movie. Where it's like it doesn't really matter if this guy existed or not. Yeah. It doesn't matter if there's a paradox. The point of this movie is, is these other aspects of character. And- you know what's so funny is that normally I try really hard to find the concrete one explanation that's like that makes all of it make sense but i think this movie for whatever reason makes me not want to do that you're a changed man since watching cats <laughs> you said this when we saw cats cats was so cats was so nonsensical it just broke my brain you got a hairball so in your mouth now, yeah hairball, lodged. hairball in my neurons and now i just don't feel the need i'm, I'm enlightened you know cats cats got me to nirvana and now I can watch this movie and not really worry about which one's real. Like maybe they're all just in alternate dimensions and they're just kind of linked because they're the same people in in you know in the multiverse. Like, hey, that's cool. I'm fine with that. I have a question for you guys. Do you think that this movie could be told more linearly? Like, even within the stories, they're kind of jumping back and forth and back and forth. Do you think it would be better served if they kind of structured it in a more traditionally and it kind of had a more rising action and kind of traditional climax? Yeah. No. Uh, what makes you think that it doesn't have that? Because uh, I don't give a fuck about anything that happens in this movie. I'm not attached to any characters. There's really? a bunch of information, a bunch of scenes that go on way too long. What? David, um, all the things you're listing seems like you problems. No. Man, the opening of this movie is so sick. I was in love with it immediately. It's okay. But the problem is, so it does the kind of movie trope of like getting you ahead in the action and then going back to give you the information. But all the information they give you in the Conquistador story superfluous super unnecessary this movie wait, wait, revels wait. in giving you uh these scenes and these moments that take so long to give you the smallest amount of emotional payoff and information like the scene with the first time he's doing the surgery on the monkey that scene's about 10 minutes this movie's short it's an hour and a half it's about 10 minutes uh from like walking in doing the surgery all this stuff and the information should be conveyed in like 30 45 seconds and i think this movie has a big problem with inefficiency um and so I this find is it what, so slow. This is what you're talking about when you when you talk about like the technical. Well, that's uh, one thing, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, one of the things. We're gonna get more technical but like, after. For me, I think I'm watching the movie, and I feel like the the purpose of this movie, and maybe maybe going into the second time, I kind of appreciated it more. I'm like, the purpose of this movie is just to kind of be here. It's like a trip, you know. It's like I'm just like I'm just here. It's, so, it's David, just are you saying things like in the Con- Conquistador storyline when? Uh, we go back in time. Like first, we see him outside of the temple, and then it goes back to all of the all the plot with the queen and the inquisitor and all that. And are you saying all of that is ultimately for nothing? Because well, it, it's fine. It you, you can have it, but don't make it a seven minute scene. Make it a thirty second scene. Have him walk through, show the pretty second. stuff, convey the information. Have a moment. Have a beat. Have a breakthrough. Move on. The but, scene. Yeah, the scenes just take so okay. So, so when yeah. they're doing things like it is a map. And he like, oh and he says gosh. like these three pyramids and all that yeah. because that's you're saying that's immaterial really to the that's story. That's Im- immaterial, and it's also like presented like it's national treasure. I found that MacGuffin of the dagger felt so cheesy and so. I love it. I love it, and what it's not out of place world? because she's writing it. Like it's a her, it's her drama that she's pe- penning, and it's all just for the purpose of a metaphor of their yeah. lives and and like the the. Inquisitor's uh, religion spreading across Spain like a cancer, and she has cancer, and he has yeah. to stop okay, it. Okay, so my question is, what thematic reason does the dagger have, other than being a MacGuffin? Like, what's the point of the dagger? So, so they can, they can find it. I know that's a MacGuffin. It's a MacGuffin. But, but I don't know. Saying, How do they find, find it then? Otherwise, there's, there's, there's a lot of things. In this, what is a MacGuffin? A MacGuffin is kind of the the plot item that makes the plot move forward. It's like the thing people are searching for. And like the Maltese Falcon, it's the Maltese Falcon. It goes missing. They need to find it. Uh, or like. In Pulp Fiction, it's the case. It's the kind of the most valuable thing. Yeah. It's, it's what's driving the story. Uh, and, this, and these are frowned upon? No, it's you're allowed to do MacGuffin as yeah. long as you either make a clever like take on it or it's like I not... just have... Why do you have a problem with the idea of a MacGuffin? It's fine. It's just this movie doesn't use it efficiently. Like, add a thematic element to the dagger. Add, like, for example, like you said, if there was a scalpel match shot... Yeah, then... totally. And I think that would be brilliant. And I think this movie misses a lot of opportunities to... Do things more efficiently. Add an extra meaning to a shot. Add an extra moment. See, uh, like when there's that scene when first pops to the present day, and Rachel Weisz is like, "Come for a walk with me," and he's like, "Sorry, I'm busy." No, come for a walk with me. It's the first winter, uh, and it does it a couple times. Yeah, and every time, instead of being one fucking cut, 
they take like six cuts to bring us into that time. And I'm like, Darren Aronofsky, I get it. We're in a different timeline. You don't need to take 45 seconds to cut me. One cut, oh, his hair's slightly different. Back to her. Wait, Things are you- a bit different. Then his hair's full back into normal. Like, it's such an inefficient film for like those moments where like a more a better movie would have it done in one cut in a more interesting. You know what way. I think Actually, is happening? I like, liked that part because I liked the, it too. The first time they cut to that scene, he's remembering it as a flashback uh, from the future, right? Yep. He's bald, and we see that flashback, and he's bald during that interaction. But he, d- we don't see the following scene after that. It goes back to the spaceship, right? I we, think it comes we don't. To I don't think we going, see him go into the lab at that maybe. point, right? But then it goes to the lab. But the really the one that bothers me the most is the final time it happens when he actually does go with her, and he steps into the hallway, and Ethan Suppley's like, "We gotta go to surgery, man," <laughs> um, and he's like, "No, I gotta, I gotta go to the hallway with my wife." That's such a boring scene in a better movie. That would be so trippy. They would like have the hallway be like, like geometrically what? impossible. They would have like cool cuts. It's just one shot of him like, dude, mm, that sounds uh. that sounds so extra. Well, I kind of agree with uh, David in the fact that you never really want to tell the audience something they already know. I feel like each time we enter one of these stories, I kind of have patience for it because I have I have patience for the way that the movie takes its time and to kind of establish these things and take its time with the scene because. I'm like, okay, we're we're jumping into this other story, so we need to kind of be acclimated to this again. If 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 we see the conquistador in Central America and he's fighting all the the guys, and then he gets into the pyramid, and it's like, okay, we want to know why he's here. Thirty second, a thirty second f- flashback scene isn't going to give us the emotional weight that we need to connect him to the queen and to the importance of his quest and to what's happening back in Spain. So he needs to find this. I strong disagree. I think a better filmmaker. <laughs> Uh, could do those things and like you can convey so much information and have so much more impact with less words they talk so much in this movie and it's supposed to be like a visual feast uh, but like so much is said to me and nothing is shown to me like nothing not like very little importance is given through visual storytelling it's all like what are you talking this about is important the whole there's thing so is- much like some of the first shots of Tomas are like he's standing in front of that cross and then he has the thing he brings it up to his mouth and he like smells it and it's just close up on his face all of that is visual there's no dialogue at all yeah but it's like it's such a small part of the movie most of the movie is two people shot reverse shot just talking and I, and I agree yeah, with but Riley. The most, the most important shots are these kind of like visual kind of transcendent sort of like. Well, do you guys want to get into depictions. the visual storytelling of this film? I'm not ready for that. I'm not stuff. ready for that. I'm still fighting on this dagger thing. Yeah. I agree with Riley. When he gets to the foot of that pyramid and there's that tribe there and he's got his two soldiers with him and they, they're like, first of all, this is such a sweet, sweet opening because it sets up this hero. Yeah. They're like, it's booby trapped. What if it's booby trapped? And he's like, it is. Yeah, he like, already knows the intensity, the importance oh, of what this do we quest. Do? What do we do? We break through. Yeah, and then those guys peace out. Why is this guy so dedicated that he doesn't peace out in the face of death? And not only that, he charges forward and he says, "I'm not going to die. Not today. Never." Yeah, and it's so <laughs> sick because we don't even know. At that point, we think it's just generic. Okay, it's a battle. He doesn't want to die in battle. He's yeah. a warrior. But he, yeah. it's it's totally tied in with a story that we're not even aware of yet of our immortality. And here's the thing about the dagger, David. Freaking David. If uh, Catholicism and the Inquisition is cancer, then the dagger is science. Oh. The dagger is what Tommy is using to to try to save the queen. Oh. You are making up this metaphor. It is nowhere else in the movie that a dagger or a sharp object is important. No, you can't, no, like, no, no, no. There's no other. Yeah, yeah. Like David's right. No, no, no. This you're, is. There's this is a, you're this, making up. This, this is all you. I did just think of it, but it totally fits. There's no, all these. Ana- there's all no. of these analogies. There's the queen. She's the queen to him. There's him. He's the warrior trying to solve the puzzle. Right. There's the religion is the cancer. And then how does he solve in the modern day? He solves her her plight by using science to try to find the medicine. Oh, right. See, I would in the in the past he uses the dagger to get to the tree of life. See what then I- he gets to the tree of life. <laughs> he stabs it with the dagger and he doesn't get what he wants. Oh. In the real world, he uses all the science. He has a breakthrough and he still doesn't get to live forever the way that he wants. See, I love this idea. And if it was part of the movie, it'd be great. If like in the in the past, in the present, they showed a matching shot or they tied the dagger to a scalpel or something or to science, I think that'd be a great idea. But I really believe you're overanalyzing and putting in your own meaning into the dagger now. <laughs> well, you forced me to, David. <laughs> okay, wait. I agree with you, David, that like James is just putting all of this on the movie. It's a great idea. But at the same time, it works perfectly. So why is that not a valid analysis? Why is that not something that Darren Aronofsky maybe 
like meant, and maybe he didn't implement it perfectly. If he meant it, he would have implemented it. He worked hard on this movie. Are you and sure? Like, yeah. But he also did have to retool the script and slash the budget by half. Totally. And he it, can apparently be pretty... he thinks it's a better movie because of the lower budget, and I strongly disagree. Uh, but what did this movie do to you, David? Or, originally, this was supposed to be some epic movie with with Kate Blanchett and Brad Pitt. Yeah, and they went to Australia and they built this giant pyramid in the bush, <laughs> and they already they sank like half yeah. their budget on it. And then Brad Pitt pulled out and he went and did Troy instead. Right. So Warner Bro- Bros. Like said, no, nope, the they pulled the plug. It was two and a half years later. They had to sell all of the stuff they built. Like they had to sell off all the materials used in that. Like. Mayan pyramid and stuff to like recoup the costs, and then and then Aronofsky goes to China and India by himself and does some soul searching <laughs> yeah. in what he described as a dark t- period of his life. Oh man! Then he in two and a half weeks retools the screenplay with a new idea, right? And they made a graphic novel with it. Oh really? You, they they published like a graphic novel version of this movie before the movie came out. Spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Big spoilers to graphic novel readers. And then they did. They got half the budget. He approached Jackman because he saw him on a Broadway show or something. Oh, the boy from Oz. Yes. Okay. And then Hugh Jackman suggested that Rachel Weiss plays the leading lady role. Rachel Weiss was Aronofsky's partner at the time. Yes. <laughs> wow. Darren Aronofsky has a weird trend of like casting his girlfriends and things. Is that true? I think he was dating uh, Jennifer Lawrence uh, when they filmed Mother. Huh. Oh. Yeah. Anyways. I can kind of get the sense that there's a bit of a rush in this movie where I don't feel like everything is neatly paid off. Everything is like well thought out. So I like that the story is really about letting go of life and accepting death. And that's kind of the key to immortality. But I think the fact that both Rachel Weiss and Hugh Jackman appear in all three stories kind of works against that. If like Hugh Jackman appeared in three lives because he's holding on to life so tightly and Rachel Weiss was in one or like more abstract in another, like it might be more interesting. But because... More yeah. abstract than another. She's what? a goddamn tree. She's there though. She's she's there. She's yeah, yeah. literally she standing there. Uh, yeah, but she's that's like a projection. She's dead. Yeah, but I'm saying that like okay, she's accepted death, but she hasn't died. So what do you thematically, mean? that doesn't well, that's work. To him. She died in the in the future. Sort of. At yeah, the she, end. Well, when she he, died. Once he accepts death. Yeah, because yeah. that's the journey. It's a, it, the journey is him uh, struggling to accept death, yeah. not her. That's fine. She that's accepts a, that's like a pretty good theme. That's one of my positives of the movie is like the theme's clear and okay. stated and it's there. All right, but? Uh, it should be a 15-minute short film. But she's not alive as the tree, or is she? Here's a, that's a good question. Because, okay, the whole thing in this movie is she tells that anecdote about their tour guide from, in, I guess they went to Mexico or something. <laughs> they went to Chicken Pizza, Chichen Itza, and had a, <laughs> had a tour guide there and the tour guide said, my father died and he was buried and then his body disappears and then we planted a tree over his grave and he's in that tree. Right. His, part of his life is in that tree and when that tree bears fruit and the birds eat that fruit, f- my father soars with the birds. And right. when those birds birds shit on your windshield, my father is on <laughs> your windshield and when you squeegee it off and put the squeegee into its little like receptacle of gray water, my father yes. stews in that gray water. Death is yeah. the road to awe. Half of that I made up. <laughs> yeah. So my, my question... I think it's set up that Rachel Weiss is the tree, but uh, after reading like the Wikipedia, he becomes the tree of life when he drinks drinks the tr- tree jizz. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's in the Conquistador fictional. Yeah, but story. they're all tied together. There's not like multiple tree of lives, is there? Do you no. think there's multiple? So no, he no. is the tree of life. I think I think in the sci- in the modern day yeah. timeline, yeah. the 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 tree that they found in South America, whatever, is like there could be multiple trees of life. Here's what I think happened, David. I think that you saw all the critic reviews of this, and you're like, oh, Roger Ebert said that this was the worst movie of the century, maybe. So you go in being like, oh, I have to watch this movie. It's an hour and a half. It's a pretty short movie. Super short. It feels like three hours. And you're like, oh, I have to watch this movie. So like, as soon as you understand what's going on, you want it to go quicker. But I like being taken on that journey. Like... We see the ball. We see Space Tom kind of having this memory of of his wife coming, being like, "Come walk with me in the snow." And we know that it's gonna go to present day or whatever. Yeah. But like, why do we gotta jump there right away? Take okay. a little bit, like you know, have a, guide us through it a little. bit. Let me bit. take you on a journey into visual storytelling. Why this movie is so inefficient? I know it's inefficient, but sometimes inefficiency is why nice. Why is this movie black and white? It is so ugly. This monochromatic look that they have of just black and white and warm white and like things kind of tending a little bit towards yeah. green is ugly. No, and then on top of that, no, I agree. I agree with this. 
What do you mean it's black and white? It's basically monochromatic, where there's almost all all color has been desaturated out of the film. So it's basically just black and white with warm and cold white as the light. And so there's like 20, 30 percent saturation in these scenes. Yeah. And it's not that great. And the payoff is that at the end, when Hugh Jackman gets to the Tree of Life, there's this like full saturation moment. That's still only like 40 percent saturation. That doesn't look that good. This movie does not look that good. It looks okay. I love this. Now, when you say which parts, are you talking about the color grade, or do you mean like, because I think that the space scenes, when they get to the Nebula, they look fantastic. They look okay. But he's saying there's not very much color in the I think that's a mistake. I think that a director has a limited set of tools that they can use to tell their story. And Darren Aronofsky, very, very conscientiously, because of the era this movie came out in, chose to abandon that that tool he chose to abandon color because that's what was cool in 2006 mm. this like grayed out uh gritty movie that's what was the style and i think it yeah totally takes away from the payoff of this i'm On, thinking of troy totally troy stuff like that was or, like really like batman, batman begins yeah. came out the year, <laughs> yeah. batman begins came out the year before and like it's a great movie but like it kind of ushered in the era of like drab darker style dark gritty reboot totally and so i think he's chosen to remove that that tool out of his kit on top of that he uses lines to tell his story wrong. Lines so, as in dialogue, spoken lines? No, as in like visual lines. So in visual storytelling, there's kind of the theory is your vertical lines are kind of uh, representative of like holding, like prison. Horizontal lines are a sign of peace uh, and diagonal is a sign of conflict. So if you watch a Pixar movie, turn on <laughs> your vision. <laughs> I'm into this. Turn on your vision and like really pay attention when you're in a villain's lair it's all going to be triangles when you're in like a good time it's all going to be smooth horizontal lines when they're in prison vertical lines he doesn't seem to grasp this idea and in scenes when it's huge conflict or someone's stuck in a prison he'll use horizontal lines because that's what was there and that's what looks good uh, and then he'll have a shot that's just vertical lines that looks cool or sorry, see, diagonal line and it looks cool but it doesn't communicate that idea see i have a huge problem with this yeah thinking that filmmakers have to abide by like the established norms of like when you're in prison use vertical lines when things are cool use horizontal like i i don't care about see, that a good like, maybe, filmmaker maybe a good wait, wait, filmmaker. wait 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 maybe that's what has emerged you know naturally yeah. over the course of like filmmaking that like normally this is what happens and like that tends to like get a message across well or something but like don't i i have a real problem with taking that established like emergent behavior mm -hmm. and and judging this movie based well, on the that. question is why is it emergent is it because there's some kind of like natural law of psychology that you're going to interpret it correctly it's that. or is david seeing it because yeah, uh, right, he knows but, about it, so he's looking for it. Right, and that's if it doesn't have it, he doesn't like it. That's the problem that I have with what you're saying right now is that, like, okay, maybe if, like, you know, this was some law that was established that, like, it always works better that way, and he didn't do that, it's like, okay, I have a problem with that. But, like, it's a, it's an emergent thing. So, wait a it's second. It's not like somebody who wrote the book on how to make a movie, and that's the rules. Yeah, but it's like, and he music. broke the rules. Okay, I want to make a happy song. Okay, I'm going to do like a dissonant, like an augmented fourth. Yeah, like, you can do that. You can, but you have to, like, make that a point and develop that idea. Sure. Aronofsky does not take that idea and develop it. He just ignores it. So are you specifically yeah. referring to any scenes like uh, the Tree of Life stage, for example, where that's that big, open, peaceful waterscape with the tree in the yeah, middle that's, that's like, fine and like the visuals for that is i think clearly the best visuals of the movie the mm -hmm. space although the comp like the, the comp on the tree is really bad when they the zoom soft, out the soft edges on the roots looks terrible this movie aged has aged horribly in my opinion not all aspects of it to me i think when they're in space it looks great still well it's I cool i like looked... that they did the macro photography of deep sea like creatures yeah. and that's what that's kind of ethereal look and it looks good deep sea creatures i thought it was like they they did macro photography of like petri dishes yeah and they're, they're it's chemical oh, reactions yeah, sure. and like these things bunch, spreading in did, fluids there's cool. a bunch of like biological phenomena that they kind of like substituted for you know baked cgi Sh or shout whatever. out to peter parks yeah Oh, uh, that's Spider-Man for those who don't know. Oh, nice. <laughs> so, no. Parker. <laughs> Peter Parks. <laughs> no, but okay, compare it to The Tree of Life. Uh, and there's kind of similar like, okay, now's the, the time. The film, The Tree of the Life. The film, The Tree of Life. Uh, where there's similar, okay, we're going to take a moment, we're going to pause, and we're going to go through space. And they did full CG for the space in Tree of Life, but it's so majestic. I'm like wowed by it every time I see that movie. And like part of it is the score. And we'll get into that later. But part of it is just the visuals and like the limited palette that Aronofsky chose to limit himself to and doesn't like efficiently 
evolve or build off or, or take in any interesting directions for me. I'm a, I'm a hundred, look, David, I'm a hundred percent with you on this. This, the, in terms of color and like the potential that is lost by not using it. They don't like yellow? <laughs> <laughs> My least favorite color, okay? Hey, yellow, tan is a great color. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I guess no, I'll agree I, with you. It could have yeah. been like a riot of color that they're going yeah. towards. That would have been cool. Well, and but certainly like, as a payoff at the end, like the Tree of Life scene should have been crazy. And it was just like, yeah, it's cool. It's but nice. I think I think I, the Tree of Life scene is crazy. It is crazy. I, I think that um I think that limiting himself to that specific color palette for me kind of allows me to focus a bit more. And it, and it also kind of gives it this like otherworldly quality where if everything was in full color, I'd kind of be like like the oh, fact- they're in space. Oh, yeah, he's yeah. flying into a star yeah. raz- rather than he's going towards the light, the right, big white right. light. The, the fact that everything is kind of grayed out and washed out kind of gives it this sort of like, it, 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 for me, it, it, it makes me want to think about things in a more abstract way instead of thinking like, Hey, he's a sci- hey, that's not how spaceships work. Like as if, you know, he could get to the star and live forever. This might be like, a good time like- to, uh, good time to mention you rally that almost all of the sets and set pieces in this movie are designed to be linear the journeys where the hero starts in darkness and goes towards light. Did you notice that? Oh, really? That? Yeah. It, like the queen, when he goes to approach the queen, yeah. he basically, he just like walks under uh, these kind of, um, they're spaced apart lights where he, you know, I'm in shadow, now I'm in light, I'm in yeah. shadow and I'm light, and then he yeah. gets toward her and then uh, she's the source of light and he's right. walking toward, so everything is like that. There's a, there's a, like a, almost a match frame journey that he goes through in the hospital he goes from uh, the elevator to the hospital room where she's dying it's the same thing yeah and then when he gets to the temple they called that uh, what do they call it he, he said that he wanted it to be like a birth canal the, the <laughs> there's the mouth yeah. of the temple and inside the walls are just like dripping with blood yeah and it goes uh the tree of life is at the end of that that's the source of light and in the way is that is the mayan and warrior and as priest. well Shabalba, as he's approaching the dying star it's in this kind of like canal that looks like <laughs> you know a fleshy kind of thing yeah, Very like cool. Emanating it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. We got to talk about the music because... David Groans, the score is sweet. I know. It's really but, bad. But, I'm going to scientifically and mathematically explain why it's bad. Let's like, hear go ahead. Let's hear Riley tell us why it's so good. Okay, well, I don't have mathematical scientific reasonings why it's cool. I think I just, uh, I rocked out to this soundtrack many times after I saw the movie uh, in 2007 or whatever, and I would just be like, play it in my room while I'm like cleaning my room and like go like go nuts. While the movie's on, I don't really even notice that there's this motif or this refrain <laughs> until about the last quarter and I'm like, oh man, it's kind of like the same thing but evolving oh. and getting more intense and higher. I, if I had oh, one criticism, scary. if I had one criticism, is it, it would be that the motif, there's one motif and it plays throughout the whole movie and it never stops. It doesn't bother me the way that it did in Black Klansman though. Mm. In Black Landsman, they have this really cool little like '70s guitar riff that plays all the time. Oh, yeah. It feels kind of like I'm watching some kind of like '80s detective. I've seen that movie, but thing, I didn't notice but it. It's just this one little riff, and uh, I just got kind of sick of it. That's in the that's this movie. Yeah, and that's yeah, sweet. Yeah. It's Clint Mansell. Yeah. His name decidedly sounds like a dirty word. <laughs> <laughs> and Clint Mansell is uh, also, he's worked on like all of the Aronofsky right. movies. And he did um, he did the uh, Requiem for a Dream. That's super famous. And, and the, you know, the end of this movie sounds a lot like, I think I, when we said that we were going to watch this movie, I started singing the song from Requiem from a Dream. And I was like, wait, no, that's from Requiem from a Dream. What, what's the fountain one? And then, Watching this one again, I'm like, oh, it does sound a lot like, like Requiem for a Dream. Thematically, it's very, very similar. the The end scene where he's kind of like getting like obliterated by the star, very similar in t- in terms of overall feel. I think that the feel and the totally chord progression fits. is sort of related as well. The feel totally fits. Uh, it succeeds in unifying the three different times. Yeah, it has a kind of. It has enough of a medieval Renaissance fair kind of feel to it to belong in the Conquistador timeline. Yeah. But it also has like the gravitas that fits and then the melancholy that fits the other the other ones as well. Mm-hmm. I, I honestly that last scene um, sells the music for me. Like the whole the whole movie, you're kind of like, all right, I get it. This is the motif. But then seeing its culmination, I think makes it all worth it. When it goes like super like a lot higher with oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> 
the whole movie is kind of like taking parts of this song and kind of like, okay, we're only using this part and we're only using this part. And go like, now it's strings. Now it's piano. Now it's like the choir at the end. So good. All right, David, you're waiting over there in the corner. What's wrong with this? There's so much. Okay. Clint Mansell. He's so confident. It's never, it's never an opinion. He's consulting his notes. He has a treatise. It's never an opinion. It's always... I could make a whole video Scientists conducted a study and um, they found out that the facts are that this is bad. <laughs> yeah. So I think the first po- point to compare it to is Tree of Life. I think for me, Tree of Life and The Fountain are very similar movies from different filmmakers. One's mm. boring. One's good. <laughs> yeah. Tree of Life's great. Um, but you think of the use of music in that movie. So he uses like uh, classical music, like people that are like actual composers from the past that have used it. And he uses these songs that actually evoke an actual sense of awe, aren't the most basic form of music. This music is so basic. So it's just an A minor the whole time. He never mm-hmm. changes modes. He never changes like things. It's the same progression. It's the one, four, five, six, four, five. Yeah. Over and over, over and over. Never develops it. So that's the same as La La Land. Da, 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 da. That's the same thing, but La La Land instantly evolves it musically and tries to pay it off in different ways. This movie does the same progression. It's from the first time you hear it to the last time. It's the same notes over and over, louder with better arrangement. Okay, first off, instrumentation. you can't compare it to La La Land because um, that's a movie about music in large part. Yeah, but so Real like, Life isn't and it has better music too. I'm just yeah, that's but you're the closest, saying that's the closest example of the that exact musical motif. It's the exact same notes yeah. in a major scale. But you're saying in Tree of Life, it do, you're comparing it to classical music, not original score. And you're wanna, saying that's more evocative for you, but that might be because you know those songs. There's an idea in music that's there's the different modes. So like basically mm. there's a, the major scale, minor scale, but between all those there's like uh, Iodian or Mixolydian or, or all these things. Right. And real composers, good composers, people that aren't Clint Mansell, understand Jeez, that. Jeez, man. Well, it is true that Clint Mansell does not have uh, classical training. Sure doesn't. Sure. Uh, that like you can evoke stronger feelings. You can do pull and pull, like push and pulls. There's tension. Like I said about Darren Aronofsky, there's different tools you can use in music by changing these modes, by changing that progression of notes through the different modes, through different chords, through different ideas, and you can evolve that and and stretch it out and have more tension, more release, not just have A minor, same fucking four notes over and (laughs) over. From the beginning to the end. It's pathetic and it's lazy. Whoa, he's angry. (laughs) And yet, Riley, who I think is at least on equal terms as a musician with David, loves it. He's wrong. I love its simplicity. (laughs) <laughs> there, there. See, but this is the thing. I think, I think, um, you, you went to, you went two levels above me in piano lessons. Yeah. You, you said you went to grade ten. I only made and it it's to grade eight. It's exponential, so it's like. <laughs> I, st- <laughs> yeah. So, it's like so the those Richter two scale. levels, those two levels are basically infinite. Yeah. Yeah. It's, in terms of the skill it gives you. Yeah. I stopped at grade eight because that's when you are like allowed to teach piano lessons. I never taught piano lessons, but that's what my parents made me go up to. <laughs> but anyways. I think that at a certain point, I I I wanted more and more complex music. Like I wanted, I wanted to like if I heard something and I was like, this is this is technically not complex enough. It's not creative. I'm not interested. And I wanted more and more complexity. And then at a certain point, I'm kind of like, at a certain point, music gets so complex that it's not fun to listen to anymore. And that's where you see these kind of like super avant-garde composers come up with with songs that and and symphonies that are basically just people banging pots and making noise and it's just like Yoko Ono, you total hack. It's just dissonant and it's not good. And I'm not saying that that complexity is bad. I'm just saying that having that experience I think brought me back to a place where I'm like the really good music is simple and powerful. And I, I'm not saying you don't have an argument. I think that your argument, like Clint Mansell, not classically trained, he could have done a lot with this score that would have made it even better. For sure. But I think that what it is, is powerful because I feel it, James feels it. I I, I watched this movie and I got stoked on the soundtrack with one of my friends who has since, Stefan Meyer, shout out to you. I haven't talked to you in many, many years. s and baby. But he went on to like study music at some ger- like fancy German university. I don't even know what it's called, but I like watched one of his symphonies that he composed recently and it was like it was incomprehensible to me. 
It was and, no Clint Mansell. But. Yeah, it was no. And he <laughs> was joking. You know, back in 2007, he was jamming r- along to this right with me. So like, maybe it is. It's it's simpler. It's it's not what it could be. And uh, but I think that its simplicity, uh, once again, uh, you know, with the with the color thing, it serves to kind of bring you in and like make you focus more. Like it's, it's not- there to support the drama. Yeah, we're not watching a a, a symphony. And the drama, I think, it doesn't outshine the drama. I think the drama is intense. But I think, for me, there's nothing in this movie that feels larger than life. And I think in a surreal film about fighting for immortality, you Mm. need to have elements that feel huge and, like, bigger than my imagination. And there's nothing in this movie that feels like my brain is being stretched in any way. You don't think traveling through space with the Tree of Life... Eating it. ...in a sphere of, like, energy, trying to make union with a dying star that's not larger than life enough for you literally rick and morty episodes with better visuals than the fountain rick, what? That's rick and morty is 10 true. years after you know that's not even true that's 100 percent true 2d yeah like episode looks season like three episode five drew it on a napkin 16 minutes in when they go through time and it's a parody of that scene and it's way more interesting than anything in just the because fountain. it's more extra doesn't mean it's better david it's more interesting yeah to you yeah, and I I'm, think I am the arbiter. I think well, fact. that's how you're behaving. That's how you're <laughs> I'm acting. Because like here I am, like I think that you have a valid argument. You know, like I like I think that I if I had higher expectations for this movie, if if someone had said to me, "Yo, you got to watch the Fountain. It's freaking trippy. It's amazing." And then I watched it, and I was like, "This is freaking basic." Like I think I might have had a similar reaction, yeah. but I think this is one of the first movies that I saw where I was like. Whoa! What? I have to accept death, you know. Like it's it's inevitable, you know. And and it's like that. I had that early experience with it, so I think maybe I. I mean, I I will admit, I think I am watching it with a little bit of rose colored glasses. I gave it a six because I'm like I understand. I think all of the things that you're putting forward, I I don't think I've heard them elucidated uh, in such a way. And I think you did a good job. You're doing a good job, but but I I still. Despite those flaws, I still love it. I think it's the I, I think I like this movie for similar reasons. I don't want to say the same reasons, but similar reasons why people love, you know, the Rise of Skywalker or something. Because Here when we I go. when I saw when I saw the Rise of Skywalker, I had all these expectations. I'm like, this is what this movie has to do in order or this is what the sequel trilogy in general has to do in order for me to be happy with it as not just art, but also like the cap on this franchise that has meant so much to me in my life and I had these expectations and because it didn't live up to those expectations and because they were also just bad movies well we're not going to get into it but um, there are many reasons why those are one of the reasons why I didn't end up liking this movie and I think that's one of the reasons why you and Roger Ebert rip my soul (laughs) animal my spirit animal (laughs) said this movie is like a horrible horrible movie I think you're right. And I think if this is like the third time I've watched this movie and the first times I watched it, I enjoyed it a lot more because when you watch a movie to like be a critic, you're watching or paying a lot more attention and you're trying to find out the things you like or you don't. Right. And when I focused in that lens, I started to be like, oh gosh, this thing, this thing Mm. and pulling it apart. I think from a, a macro level, there is a lot of brilliant stuff in this movie and the idea and like the exploration of death is good. But I found this quote from Darren Aronofsky that makes me both hate him oh. and this movie so much. Hey, if we want to talk about how much of an idiot he is, I'll, I'm, I'm on I'm on that bad. <laughs> Let's go. Movie. I want to hear this quote. Okay, so this quote is: "There are a lot of fountain haters out there." <laughs> Speaking of the Venice Film Festival, I call them faders. The film's about the fact that it's okay that we die and we should come to terms with it. But many people don't want to think about that, so why pay money for a meditation on losing someone you love? Everything about Western culture denies that. It was pre-Obama, smack in the middle of Paris Hilton's time. But there's there's been some serious turns now. People are starting to realize the party's over, finally. So we can stop thinking about the culture of superficiality and start to remember that there are other things going on. Wait a second. Yeah, that's pretty so, pretentious, So, the, so the, he's saying the reason people didn't like this movie is because of Paris Hilton? Yeah. <laughs> Just the idea that people don't like the movie because they didn't get it. It's yeah. like, fuck you, dude. No, no. I, it's dude, pretty but no, but that is, that is also... Pretty true because I saw some reviews. I was I was trying to see the consensus, and I found this one website, and this dude was like, 
this movie was so boring. Me and my teenage son were pissed. <laughs> It's like, but they're also, but like, I think you're that's just also dumb. Like, that's a small point of data because there's a lot of reviewers that are like very carefully pulling apart. Like, yeah. they understand the multi idea thing. I learned a new word for this review: torporific. Woo. Uh, it's inducing of lethargy or <laughs> <laughs> or apathy. Oh, and it was in reference to the changing timelines. And I think that's a perfect word like for it, how I feel about this movie. Like, puts you every time it. it switches and they leave you on a cliffhanger, it's like, oh, come on. See the, now. That's so funny because it's, you know, I didn't feel that way. But but um, I think a point against what you were saying, James, is that if people didn't like it because they didn't get it, then I think critics would like it. Like, well, I, I think, don't know. Maybe there's think, like a curve. There's like a parabola where like you're too dumb to get it, so you don't like it. Then you're at James's level of IQ where you like it, and then you're at David's big brain and you hate it again. <laughs> I, yeah, quite possibly. I really do think it is about framing. And like if I had never heard anything about this movie and I saw it for the first time, no expectations... I probably would have loved it. There's so uh, much to like, though. There is a do lot. Do you like, to like the acting in this movie? I think it's great. I think they actually do a good job. If you're a fan of of Wolverine mm. and you think Hugh Jackman's a bad bitch, watch him in this movie because he's, he's stretched way for way yeah. further. In he this does movie. a great job. Yeah, he's I, a good actor. I I found myself multiple times being like, I hate this guy. Like I hate Tom. Yeah. He's the worst. It's just like just he's kind of an asshole. Well, he is, but that's the one of the most interesting questions in the movie. It's like. To what extent should you work to keep uh, the person you love alive when every minute that you're working towards that, you're not spending time with them? At mm. what point should you cut your losses and just spend your, the, her final days on yeah. Earth with her instead of trying to prolong it? It's kind of funny because the movie almost, it almost justifies his behavior because he, at the end, he, he, he does it. He, he was like two days too late. Yeah. yeah. And the, I guess, is the implication that they, they fixed death? Eventually, yeah, because that's why he's alive on the spaceship. Wow. I, th- I think right, Nice I, job, Tom. I think what I would have wanted more from these characters is either for them to be even more grounded and real and developed or to be totally mythical. And I feel like this movie doesn't have a mythical I, sense in the character. I feel like Izzy kind of is. Sort of. And She's I think you're right. Weird. She's the most mythical. But I wish, like, like again, Trio Life, uh, there's the parents of the kid who's remembering all this stuff. And, like, they're his parents and they work in that A level. But they're also... God and the Holy Spirit. Like, they work on another level of, like, a mythicality. In, in Mother, you're talking about? No. Wait, wait, what are you talking about? <laughs> in the true life. No, but, well, Izzy's the queen. Sorry. Yeah. Here's an efficient scene, though. When they go out onto the onto the roof and they're looking That's a good at scene. Shabalba yep. in the snow. because she, Shabalba. She's teaching him about it. And then he's being like, oh, you know, this is really sad. Like, your feet are cold and, like, you're dying. And then she's walking into the house. And yeah. he's like... Uh, he is and she turns around and he throws a snowball on her face and it's like you, we get a glimpse there right yeah he should and have whipped it way faster though then we would have gotten out of that scene faster <laughs> <laughs> no but I like that that like she has her bare feet because she's not feeling anything because the brain tumor is growing and like there's a lot of good in that scene right uh, I think where like other places where I wish there was more information is in the sound design of the movie like they're they're in space in this magic mystical bubble and like the sound design is so simple it's so thin there's not like multiple layers of like sound or life or like some elements going on in space it's and I feel space like, dude there's no air but that's no one can hear you scream yeah but that's boring that's like very boring sound design space and would a be... good sound designer would find some kind of thematic reason or something to add in there like have better reverberations inside this dome have mm-hmm. like an element of like storytelling through the sound same with like uh, after I guess she's dead or no she has her seizure so after Izzy has her seizure there's a scene goes completely silent and he's walking on the street and it's just like this big tracking shot down the street in and Montreal what, in Montreal great and then what happened and then he steps in the road and there's a car and it's like hey I'm marking here yeah uh, and the sound <laughs> and the sound comes in the sound comes in and like that felt kind of out of place I was like why totally and yeah. that there's a way to make silence effective like even Star Wars did it better they made a silence so powerful where everyone's talking like, about <gasps> Attack of the Clones when they're in that no. asteroid yeah, yeah that's the one <laughs> yeah <laughs> Love it. No, Blah. in uh, Last Jedi, when the Holden maneuver happens, they blow up everything, and it's just complete silence for a second. It's like, whoa! But whoa, this Ryan it just Johnson feels is a genius, brilliant man. Uh, but this, it just <laughs> feels like he's trying to go for that, but it's not an intimate shot. It's a far removed shot. It's like a medium wide, yeah, uh, down the street, and it's also like not that interesting going by all this stuff. I'm a, I'm a hundred percent with you on this, David. I I think that Darren Aronofsky uh, has clumsily stumbled his way into. Uh, discussing deep thing, deep themes with his movies before, and I don't think that he is a genius uh, auteur in any sense of the word. 
He is apparently a rich prep school boy who uh, read a lot of classics and probably thinks that he's a genius. And these are the movies that we get. He he stumbles upon deep themes because yeah. I like this movie. I think that it's good. Yeah. What do you mean stumbles upon? Like the whole movie is designed around these I mean, themes. The way, not, they're not incidental. The stuff that David is saying about the lack of technical skill, the lack of well, a I coherent, also, okay, like I'll, like a unified vision for how to portray things. I, I see that. What do you mean lack of unified vision? Every scene, like I said, is is this journey. Like there is, there's definitely a unified vision. And in the bubble, there is some sound design. It's almost ASMR levels when he's doing the tattoo ritual. He like pulls out his little ink quill thing yeah, like, he's, yeah it I is. like he sets the shit down and it's like yeah. whoa this sounds cool i like the tattoo especially the first time or like i guess chronologically the first time you do it when he's like is he's just died and he's doing it and he's crying i think that's a pretty yeah. good scene what i don't love is the voiceover when they're fucking panning over the arm and he's like the memories these are all memories uh, each and every one. Yeah, we didn't need that. like i get it i i understood from like the visual of that like he's grieving and like each thing is that and like it just feels so film schooly and so simple. Film schooly is a very good word to describe this movie. Yeah, but it's a good film school movie. Are you crazy? What no do you one mean? in film school can make this movie, man. What are you talking about? This is a this is a technically sophisticated movie. It is, yeah. man. No, I think you, David's you, arguing. If you're in I film think... school, you could have flowers burst out of someone's chest without CG. Oh well, okay, sure. The, yeah, but that the stuff te- technical money. effects in that yeah. in that scene are well done. I I think the arguments that David has laid out. See, this is what I'm saying, right? I'm, I'm, I'm. What, what did I say? I'm at the. Beginning? Are you going to end at a five point three? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, if anything, I was thinking about bringing my rating up a bit. But, um, what did I say? I was, I was Six. Su- Six. easily swayed or something at That's the beginning. What I said, um, I think the arguments that David has laid out in this podcast are 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 well formulated. I just disagree that those uh, technical failings make it a horrible movie. I think that the end result is still very enjoyable. And uh, quality because of the uh, the the focus that it that it elicits. It, it makes you not having all these crazy, wild, crazy things happen makes you kind of focus in on the theme a little bit more for me, anyways. And uh, yeah. And how about that shin quivering emotion? The wh- shin quivering. Quinch. <laughs> <laughs> chin quivering you know when you're crying oh. and your chin's like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Man, hugh this, jackman nice job buddy like hugh jackman he Watch brings Rob, it. man he's so good i love the delivery of this well, okay line if when you he, like wolverine and you're not gonna watch a musical this is a happy yeah, medium sure fair enough the the line when he at the at the funeral when he walks away and he's like death is a disease like any other and there's a cure and i'm gonna find it and it, like i love uh, his delivery of that line was great for me he's got a lot of great deliveries in this one yeah he's good intensity yeah. Um, I found this movie has too many extreme close-ups on things, and sometimes they're effective. Like the close-up on the tree with the hair raising is necessary for kind of telling the story. Well, Aronofsky loves those macro yeah, close-ups, but just like uh, all the the drug use. Yeah, things but I find them so much more powerful in that or in Black Requiem. Swan. Yeah, in Requiem or or Black Swan. In this, there's a few shots. I'm like, this shouldn't have been extreme close-up. Like the scroll rolling out, or like. Uh, like there's a shot of her nape that he goes into kiss and it's just like an awkwardly framed shot that doesn't feel intimate or close like Mr. Nobody has like a very similar shot of a nape but it feels like of very visceral Mr. Nobody has a lot of nape a shots a lot of nape <laughs> shots <laughs> and here comes uh, the nape yeah, shot it just feels so like tactile it feels like you're there uh, kissing this girl it's yeah. suitable for like the ink uh, like yep, the, the tip of the tattooed yeah. well you what know what they should have done for that nape shot is uh, <laughs> rotated 90 degrees so it's like parallel with the tree shots, because yeah. that's what it's supposed it should to have be, been the right? Scalpel, the tree, the knife, everything. Yeah. Same thing. I have, I do have a gripe, you guys. Ooh. In one of the final scenes where he's burying that seed to plant the tree that he'll eventually travel with in space, uh, it's winter, bro. He he has his bare hands. He wipes to the side some snow, and apparently, you're telling me he could just penetrate the frozen ground <laughs> Dude, to the extent that he, can, that he can plant a tree and that it's going to take and grow? This is inaccurate <laughs> to conventional gardening wisdom. I know that when they shot, it was minus 15. Oh, and wow. that, sh- that shows how how Celsius. foolish of a f- and unskilled of a filmmaker <laughs> Darren Aronofsky is. If oh, he knew bullshit. anything about filmmaking, he'd know that you have to dig a little hole before you put a seed in. See, I think this is the prequel to <laughs> the Wolverine movies, because really... <laughs> Wolverine was the conquistador, and he drank from the tree of life, and this Wolverine oh! spirit came out from him. His immortality and his regeneration was Heck born. yeah, dude. And then, like, oh, I don't know. So you're saying, like, know. saying like you know, 50, 150 years later, the conquistador kind of rises out of that bed of flowers, yeah. and he's just kind of like, 
<laughs> Can we talk about that Tree of Life scene? Yeah, for sure. I think it's so dope. It is a beautiful scene. Freaking dope, dude. Like, he, okay, first we got to start with that hallway. Yes. Where he meets that high priest. The vagina hallway. Actually, we should even back up to when he's fighting those... <laughs> yeah, fighting yeah. All those, so, the, all those so this mines. is that's actually funny because I I love that uh, early scene as well with him like fighting the million Mayans or whatever the big the big squad of of Mayans and they, they don't kill him for some reason and that totally surprises him yeah they eject yeah. they eject him onto the stairwell and then they're like telling him to go up the stairs and when he realizes that he, he's not gonna die right then he's like elated he's like whoa it yeah. worked I'm going up and I wonder I mean. Who knows why they did that? There's probably some well, trends. The first son, maybe the they first saw the first father as yeah, well. First father. But uh, originally, this movie was going to have a bunch of like giant battle scenes uh, because that was cool at the time. Troy and Lord of the Rings and all that stuff. The people had given a I'm gotten a taste. Did, Narnia. What? I'm glad it doesn't. Well, I can't. Yeah. Ima- it was a whole different screenplay. Yeah, yeah it was a completely different movie. It was going to be this like giant epic. Uh, movie. And I guess and you could make kind that of like if you focus personal. in on the Conquistador side and made it like a Gear Wrath of God and it's about like this Conquistador who has to get to the Tree of Life yeah. and it's about that, then you could make it. So like he you. makes it up, he makes it up the steps, confronts the priest. With that flaming sword. Flaming sword, pretty cool. It was cool. <laughs> I always love a flaming sword. I saw a behind the scenes thing where like for the reverse shot where they're showing Hugh Jackman's character and the sword's not even in frame, they still have to light it up and like hold it near him just to have the lighting, right? Oh man. Um, and so we see him, like, uh, we assume that he gets killed by it many times. We, we see that scene like three or four times throughout the movie. And he, like, the implication is that the sword's coming towards him and he's going to die. And then at the end... Well, first he gets stabbed. Because yes. Because he, he's unarmed. His only weapon is that dagger, that MacGuffin dagger. And then, he, uh, <laughs> he fails. He doesn't get to use it. He gets stabbed. And then that, that guy, uh, talks to him and, like... Kretchen or whatever their cool Whoa. language is. At least you know the you know a that's name wrong. of a language. That, that's like a Peruvian like could be modern. French. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh bonjour, first father. <laughs> I did not know it was you, Papa. <laughs> <laughs> he says it's the road to awe. That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I one thing I like is, well, okay, this is kind of weird, but um. When the f- Space Jackman decides he's Space okay Jack- with he's okay with death, so then he, he goes back into his memories and then into a fictional story within his memories, and then appears in front of this fictional high priestess as an uh, uh, enlightened, enlightened being. elated yeah. being. That's cool. See, but that why? What, what were you going to say? I just think that's kind of weird. But see, I matter. like that because it kind of makes you. It makes these stories make sense not just as okay. The Conquistador one is is a is a novel. The modern day one is is real. The 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 future one is real. Like that, the fact that Space Tom can show up in the Conquistador Conquistador story could either be could either be Tom deciding to finally finish Izzy's story and be like, okay, this is how it ends. Uh, well, obviously not priest, literally because that's a stupid ending like, obviously not literally but but like that is you know space tom writing this in his head and being like okay this is the ending to the story and that's how you know when he decides that i'm going to die and that's okay you know um it could be that or it could also be that the conquistador story isn't just her novel it's a real universe it's a p- parallel dimension or whatever and these three places are parallel dimensions and they're all crossing in and out of each other yeah. vibrational waves dude that's cool is the high the high priest <laughs> So, uh, he drops to his knees and he ex- he lifts his own chin and he exposes his neck, yeah. offering it to be slit, uh, which the conquistador Tomas does. Um, but what's cool is after he does it, he grabs his body and and gently puts him on the ground. He doesn't just go, yeah, yeah and just yeah. let the guy flop over. Right. He like respectfully guides his body down. I thought that was a nice touch. Hmm. Then he gets into the tree of life and it's like such a sweet payoff. Right by now, the amazing score is just pumping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then you finally see the tree. It's it's got that sweet walk up the water. Definitely one of the best shots in the movie. And I liked, I just really liked how Jackman played it when he finally interacts with it. He stabs that uh, knife a little deep into the tree. I had to say, I think that was a little excessive. <laughs> a little excessive. You know it's a special tree, yeah, man. But I think it shows... You don't need to thrust to the hilt. I, th- <laughs> I think it shows that he maybe doesn't respect these things as much as he should. He only cares about the the cure. He doesn't care so much about like the conditions that create the cure. He doesn't have respect for life. Yeah. In general, he only is like, I want what I want. I want immortality at any cost. I don't care about this tree. I don't care if the tree 
li- stays there think- after me. I don't care if I kill the tree. I just want that sap, dude. I want that tree. Juice. I don't know, man. Because you'd think that I would think that um, Tommy would think like that, but Tomas wouldn't because he lives in a world of mysticism. He like he's he's battling an inquisitor. He, you know, and he's, yeah. But I think they're the same person. He's convinced to go see the tree because it's like it's described in the Bible, and he's like, oh man. Yeah, but like he, so he would think that it was otherworldly. Sure, but I think that what we're really led to here is that they're all the same person. So I I, I project modern day Tom's characteristics onto the conquistador as well. Regardless, he stabs it, yeah. and this unmistakably semen <laughs> stomach <laughs> substance. What it do you is, think? Can it we talk is about definitely uh, semen? Was it natural? Do you think out of like nine people out of ten making this movie, we're gonna make it look white? It just like fits. Well, no, like, I would have done like a like a colored crystallized sap, like something with glitter not glitter but like shiny <laughs> rupaul's tree race rupaul's tree race that's what oh, they would yeah. do in rick and morty so no but like <laughs> you, yeah so in uncharted 2 or 3 i guess there's like a, they're trying to find the tree of life and there's a sap and like spoilers <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's not just like elmer's glue it's just got color it's got elmer's something glue. that's what it looks like to me it's you know just elmer's glue what's funny creamy that- icing it's creamy icing. It's creamy icing. In 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 looking up some discussion of this movie after I saw it, people were like, "Oh, it's definitely meant to be like semen." And I, when I watched it, I was like, I, I, "Honestly, I'm being completely honest. It wasn't in my mind at all. I was just like, oh, it's like milk. It's like sticky milk.' I think it's meant to just look life giving. It's meant yeah. to look like a uh, fluid. Like yeah, the, yeah. So then he he no, he doesn't taste it first. No, he, he just he rubs on his or wound. It falls on the ground, growing the flowers. It sprouts a flower, oh, and that's sure. a practical effect. Yep. They had Looks they great. had a connection where they, someone else for a different play or something had made this these these props where these flowers could yeah. burst out. I think the actual flowers blooming, like the white part of the flower, I think those may be CG because they tried with time lapse and stuff and they just couldn't get right. It looks fine though. It did look really good. Like it's like bloom. It looks a little sped up yeah. to me, but it looks fine. It when does. he's pulling it out, though, I'm like, how do they do that? That's cool. I don't that's know. because he's not, on, like, it's only his head popping out of the ground, and the body there is all artificial, and that's that's the rig that has all the flowers pop out of it. Uh, that looks good. That makes sense. And then he turns into flowers, because it's like, okay, you will live forever, but not the way you think. Yeah. you will. F- together we will live for- forever as flowers. I'll be a perennial. <laughs> <laughs> and your pollen will end up on a windshield. <laughs> Maybe one day Darren Aronofsky will make a movie with like a coherent point about uh, spirituality or religion or some sort of deep theme. I think this one is coherent, but maybe he'll maybe he'll make something where uh, James can pick up on that. I don't know. I think I think his mo- okay. I think his movies are going <laughs> downhill though. Like Swan was good, and then it, like has he done anything good? Noah was his Swan. You just call it Swan. Swan. Darren, I loved Swan, dude. <laughs> dude, Swan, <laughs> best Swan, movie. dude. Uh, yeah, I think Noah was one of the biggest trash movies uh, anyone's ever made. Yeah. And he keeps trying. Keeps trying. And I Mother, was intrigued by the trailer of Mother. Mother was, it's, oh, yeah. it's okay. I was it's, intrigued enough to see it it's in theaters. Worse, it's worse than this, though. I don't think you'd like it. Oh, Mother's horrible. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's so bad. <laughs> it's pretty bad. Well, yeah. And on this podcast, like, we only do good movies. Speaking of, whoa. what are we going to do next week, boys? A vote? Did we decide? Well, Rotten We're doing Tomatoes a poll, is right? doing the summer movie showdown right now. That's right. And, and so we picked some movies that, well, are they all on there? I'm not sure. Some, yeah, they're on there somewhere. So what are the contenders? The contenders are Tobey Maguire, Spider-Man 1. Woo! The first Spider-Man movie ever made. No, that's not true. Some but. say I look like Tobey Maguire. What? Really? I uh, don't get it. No, not at all. <laughs> I yeah, do I'm not get it. it. I've had it for multiple, for multiple people. We'll I'm put a poll it. up to, uh, for that, too. <laughs> <laughs> Spider-Man 1, Batman Begins, Ooh. Iron Man, yeah. and the theme of these, obviously, is kind of the origin stories, and then Revenge of the Sith, which is not, but it's the origin story of ba- of uh, Batman. <laughs> Darth Vader. <laughs> Right? Do you think we'll ever get a big Disney crossover movie that's just like every property they own in one thing? Like a like, Smash Bros. movie? Yeah. But of Disney oh. stuff? Well, I just think Wreck-It Ralph is kind of that. Basically Ready Player One, but with all one, all one uh, production studio. Yeah. Ready Player One was pretty Shut cool up. with Shut all up. the references. No, it's just, listen, just hey. I also I watched that on a, on a plane. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean like it's... Raider Player One's fine. I'm just saying that the the, the references uh, are cool. The references. The I really like that shiny. The Iron scene. Giant is in it. It's true. I love. I have the tattoo of the Iron Giant on my back. Exactly. So you automatically have to love that. It, so. I've only read the book, not seen the movie, and Iron Giant is way past. Unless Iron Giant's a remake or something, it's way past the canon that the book is interested in. That's all. It's all interesting. Oh the 60s yeah, but to yeah. 80s. The, the, the movie, movie does a lot more. 80s mostly. The movie yeah. takes a bunch of like modern references, like they have Overwatch characters and stuff in it. So yeah. Okay. Lame. <laughs> 
Wh which of those movies do you want to do? Ch do I say? Am I supposed yeah, you to say? Obviously you want to Star Wars. Okay. I want to do Revenge of the Sith. The, David, the what most. do you want? I want to do Spider Man One. I probably want to do Batman Begins. I mean, I'll ha I'll be happy with when any he of bicep them. curls that guy from the ice. I really, <laughs> I will do. I I want to do any of these except Spider Man. Spider -Man. Really? You Ugh. should watch Man. It's good. It's good. Oh, it's been. It's good. They're it's too... been. <laughs> Superhero <laughs> movies have have come come away since those. Like like MCU, the MCU has made superhero movies much better than what Spider Man could make them. Uh guys, we'll this sounds like the it. kind of content that would be in that eventual episode. <laughs> when we talk about Revenge of the Sith, please vote for Revenge of the Sith. Please vote for Spider Man. On Twitter. In my heart. So, make me love Star Wars again. You guys think uh, you think Wolverine <laughs> could have played Batman? Yeah, he would have been fine. He doesn't Jackman? have a chin. If Do he had a mask with like, like Logan. Logan could play Batman. Hugh Jackman. Yeah. Could he play Batman? Do you think Logan could play Batman? Hmm. Have like you ever seen character. Dark Claw? It's I have. It's an amalgam the comic. Ma the amalgam comics. Yeah, yeah dude. That's Jackal? Cool. I don't know about Jackal. That's Sabretooth Joker. Oh, oh man. It's Fine. sick. Guys, check out amalgam comics. Yeah, Just Wikipedia. It's a real Wikipedia hole. You'll thank us later. The sidekick's weird. It's Jubilee mixed with Robin. <laughs> Rubini? That actually sounds <laughs> perfect. Rubily. Rubily. <laughs> All right. It's Ruben Stutters. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening, guys. Hit us up on Twitter. Vote in those polls at Carpool Critics. Message us your gripes and your pleasures. And your griffs. And your desires at <laughs> Carpool Critics Podcast at gmail.com. Love you so much.